get into like lecture. Let's get through some uh, quick housekeeping items. Um, so a couple things. So I got your minutes today. I, I, I apologize. I was kind of late in submitting the uh, or setting up the thing on Blackboard. So is there anybody that genuinely feels like they needed a little more time? It, you're going to hurt my feelings. Uh, if, if not, or if you do, I, I don't mind to extend that minute submission until, let's say, Friday. Everybody good? Okay, so <coughs> um, I want to talk about some RFIs. So I have, um, so I spoke about RFI number one, the re uh, request for information I got from Brahms. Um, let me see. Let me pull this up. So I, I went ahead and uploaded the response, and I uploaded it so that every team would have access to the response. Um, <coughs> I have a link to the video uh, that I mentioned. Now, this video is really long, um, but you, you really only care about the last 11, 10 or 11 minutes or so. There's a time stamp that I put in the letter in the response to the RFI. So if you go to this video and you start the video at, I think it's like one hour, three minutes, 25 seconds, this is what uh, you are after, which is basically sort of a, a start to finish on how to build a bridge. And it's only about 10 or 11 minutes long, so I think it's going to be pretty, uh, a pretty valuable resource. Now, um, there's two things. I, I watched it this morning, and so I'm trying to think, what, is there anything in here that's super different from typical um, uh, bridge construction that you need to be aware of? And so I, I found really two things. Um, number one, in this project, the deck forms, I, I think I mentioned this last time, that the deck forms were just sort of laid across um, uh, the girders as opposed to being separate pieces and being tied together with mounting angles and strapping and whatnot, that they were just um, laid across the girders <coughs> and the shear studs were shot right through them. That's probably not typical, but they were granted that uh, ability on this project. And two, um, and I think we mentioned this last time or discussed this, the, the bid well. Do you all know what I mean when I say a bid well? It's the device that's ran across, or it's a piece of construction equipment that's ran across the bridge that helps set the deck elevation, smooth out the deck. Um, what they used on this site was really, really small. Um, it's, a, it's basically just this little, almost like it's almost powered by a, a lawnmower motor. They just attach a cable on each end and just sort of drag it across, and it's got a little crown in it, and it just screens it accordingly. And then what they do is they run behind it on either end with a couple bull floats and just bull float it to get it smooth and then take the like the rake with the little metal spikes and drag it across to get the, the ridges on the deck and put the seal on it, put the burlap on it, and that's it. So um, it, it's, it's a little, little different. So I just wanted, wanted you all to be aware of that. Um, <coughs> now, um, I, I did struggle a little bit with the, the third question, which was, and we talked about that last time, which is how exactly do I want to set um, the limits on shipping um, in a way that is standard and isn't really going to affect every group. So this is sort of what I came up with. There's an FHWA uh, document on <coughs> uh, uh, limits regarding uh, commercial freight. Um, now, a lot of this really isn't going to matter to us, but if you go down to the very end, um, there's this ISTE, uh, ISTEA uh, freeze uh, limit for basically if you're shipping something super long. And so, for instance, this would be the limit for a truck tractor carrying uh, two trailing units. Um, this is on length. This is on weight. If you go here off of length uh, from state to state, it gives you limits on the length of your shipping piece. Now, what I suggest that we do in a, in a way that's standard for everybody is we just go off of this. The problem is this is state by state, and West Virginia has no shipping limit, okay? And so what I suggest that we do so that we all have a value that we can all go off of, is let's just take the average from the column for three, sh for three uh, shipping units, and we'll just go with that. So you average out all these numbers for, um, uh, for, uh, for three trailing units, and that's what we'll use. So I figure that's a, a simple way of coming up with a, a dimension that's going to uh, at least be citable and, and work for everybody. Sound good? Yeah, because I, I did sort of struggle with that. I'm like, what do I want to do that, that's standard? So I think this is pretty reasonable. Because a, a lot of, one of the problems is a lot of state DOT uh, 
uh, and owner agencies really don't, they don't mandate, they don't say, here is your maximum shipping length. They basically just say you kind of need to figure it out. And so, um, yeah, without any geographical information, I figure this is the most reasonable uh, approach. Any questions? Okay, now let's talk about RFI number two and you're gonna see something kind of funny on my response here in a second. So, first off, um, I got three questions on RFI number two. The first two questions, I come up with kind of the same response. So the question, this is from In The Moment, uh, and they asked me, um, do, uh, do you have to include the costs of uh, material testing? And question number two is, do you have to include permit costs? And my response to that is yes, but with some clarification. Really, it's yes only if these costs are unique to a given alternative. So the example I came up with in my response is, let's say you have two alternatives. And both alternatives are utilizing a cast-in-place concrete deck. So you're going to have folks on site doing slump tests. And you're probably going to collect cylinders and go do uh, you know, seven-day testing, 14-day testing, 28-day testing, all of that, right? But that's the same for both alternatives. So that unit cost really isn't going to affect whether or not you select alternative one or alternative two, right? So I guess my, um, my, my answer is, do you need to include those costs in your estimation for the alternative? Yes, if it's going to affect the selection of your alternative. If not, don't worry about it. Do you have to include it in your final? So, does that make sense? All right, so that's my same response for number one or number two. Let me explain what's going on with number three, because I know you're looking at this and probably thinking it's some CIA redacted document, what, what the heck's going on. So, <coughs> this design team asked me about a custom solution that they found, and they were asking me whether or not this would be appropriate. Um, my answer is yes, but in my response, I, I started thinking about it, and I'm like, well, wait a minute. This team did some work to find this sort of really unique solution. And so in my response, am I just going to tell everybody what that solution is? No, I'm going to give them a little bit of a competitive edge. Um, so my, my response is, um, is basically this. Um, uh, the, team, uh, the, the team in question, they asked about, can they use this particular solution? My answer is yes. I have no problem with that. In fact, I highly encourage you to seek out custom solutions that work for your project. I mean, you don't have to use the, the, the traditional bread and butter approach if you've got something that's unique and cost effective. I, I have no problem with that and I encourage it. My only requirement is that if you're going to use something that's out there, if you're going to use something that's unique, you have to have some type of cost data or some type of scheduling data or some way to compare alternative one to alternative two. Because if, if you've got, okay, here's this regular old bread and butter composite steel girder bridge, and I'm able to estimate its cost to the penny, but I found this really cool thing online. I don't have any idea how much it costs or uh, how long it would take to build, but it looks cool. Then that, that, there's not really a way of making a comparison. So if you find one of these custom solutions, I would suggest that you reach out to the manufacturer or the design firm or the company that, that, that generates this solution and ask them. Just Point blank, ask them. I mean, usually a lot of times these firms are pretty responsive to stuff like that. You pick up the phone, call some engineer and say, hey, I'm a student, we got a project, we saw this and we think it's really cool, our professor encouraged us to think outside the box, can you tell me a little more about it? They'll probably say yes, and they'll probably tell you everything they want to know. So, because they'll be, almost they'll be kind of flattered that you found it. So, yeah, but I wanted to guard their work a bit. So I redacted the, uh, the document. I actually went through and used the redact tools in, uh, in, uh, uh, in, in Adobe. So it's not like I highlighted it black. So if you, you know, ho hover over the font, you say, oh, nice going, Dr. Mike. Now I redacted it and, and, and went through all that. So yeah, I felt like a spy a little bit. Not really, not really, you know. I'm not that much of a dork. Um, but did that answer your question? And is everybody else okay with that? And was your question answered, or, or your question? I guess you, you were the one who submitted the RFI, so. Oh, yeah, 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 that's good. Okay. Um, anybody else? I am curious, I mean, obviously I'll respond to an RFI when I get it, but I'm curious, are there any other RFIs you think coming up the pipe? And 
you have any idea on what it's about? Just, I mean, like, if, if it, yeah, I mean, if, it, if it's a short question, like, I'm not saying don't submit the RFI, right. but if it's something I can answer quickly, I will. If not, then. Yeah. Um, do we need to, <coughs> Yeah. Um, like, do we need to get, basically, do we need to get this into operation? Is that part of us, or? Okay. Um, let, me, let me think about how I want to respond to that, because the short answer I'm thinking of is yes. Um, I'm going to, with approach labs, I'm going to kind of take the same approach that I did before, no pun intended, where um, if it's the same for each alternative, then you can kind of neglect it. You'll need to incorporate uh, it in the final. But there's also something to be said about, um, uh, if you're using, let's say, an integral system, right. then it's different than if you're using a traditional abutment and then it's just something you plop on at the end. Because right. if you're using an integral system, you're casting all that together. And so it's just not the same story. So I need to figure out how I want to word that, but that's kind of generally what my... Basically, the, the girder is not going to affect the thickness of the slab and your size. It's all going to be uniform. Is that correct? Yeah, um, but if you're using something like a post-tension segmental box, or then there isn't really a deck because it right. is the deck. Yeah, that's what I was so, I mean, but some teams might, you right, know. Right. So, so um, in that instance, like, you don't have a deck. Yeah. You know, there, there isn't one because the girder is the deck. So. Um, it does change how you determine your DC1s and DC2s and DWs a bit, but, I mean, yeah, so. Like, you might have a girder that's more expensive. Like, think you have a girder and a slab, a cheaper girder and a slab, or a more expensive girder and no slab. Which one's more viable? I don't know. It depends, so, yeah. I, I, I do know, but I'm not answering it. That's an RFI one. You don't need to submit an RFI on that. I can answer that one now. Um, so let's talk about camber, OK? Have I mentioned the concept of camber in here? OK, so I'll, I'll refresh everybody. So the idea of camber is this. All beams must uh, are subjected to what? What, what load? Just, just for the sake of discussion. Their own self-weight. So every beam is going to deflect. I, it is what it is, OK? So let's say, for the sake of discussion, let's just keep it simple, that I have a beam that's only subjected to two loads, its own self-weight and some occupancy, some live load, whether it's a truck, us, whatever, it doesn't matter. So it's self-weight and it's live load. What I can do during construction is this. Let's say for, for self-weight, I do the math from structural analysis, and it's going to deflect one inch. What I can do is I can actually take that beam and bend it upwards, physically bend it upwards one inch. So that when I take that beam and set it down, it sits flat. Okay? That's what camber is. Camber is trying to overcome dead load deflections by basically bending it in the opposite direction. So that when you, uh, when you look at the bridge in its intact state, it sits flat. So to answer your question, what I'll say is this. Um, regardless of your solution, uh, you can uh, take into account dead load deflections pretty easily. Live load, you can't. Okay, live load's pretty variable. We don't camber bridges for live loads. That, that, that we, we just, we, and we don't do that for buildings as well. It's just, it's just something we don't do. Um, what we do have, however, are deflect, live load deflection limits. Okay? Um, they are in the spec. Um, we'll probably actually discuss some of those today. Uh, and we'll also discuss between now and the next few days how to actually determine live load deflections. So, to determine live load deflections, as well as live load moments and live load shears, I'm going to need an RFI on that one, because, or somebody's going to submit me an RFI on that, and then I'm going to provide data to everybody. But walk before you can run type thing. So.
usually the goal is for it to be flat. Now, I mean, well, that's true, but is that the case for our project? No, no, that's, that's on the, the request, for or request for proposals. That's on the request for engineering services. Remember, the bridge is sloped. It has a 1% downgrade, so we don't, we don't have to deal with that. Now, um, <coughs> let me say this. Are there bridges that are arched? Well, yeah. Um, usually, the reason is not dead loads. Usually, the reason is to try and match grades on either end. See, it might sound silly, but, but to change the grade on one end, you know, like a couple percent, you might need to have an approach that goes down a, you know, a few hundred feet. And so, if you've got a bridge and you go, you've got this grade here and this grade here, usually it's like, well, we're going to have to match grade just to you know, make the structure work. So, But it's not a dead load issue. And, and I'll say this, in those extreme issues, you probably don't really even have to worry about camber because it's curved so far upwards that under dead load, it's going to go from being really curved upward to kind of curved upward. So. Yeah, in those scenarios, the trouble is just getting the bridge together. So. What do you think? Any other questions? Okay. Um, I should start opening up PowerPoints. All right. Um, so. <coughs> Last time, and I know, I know we kind of um, glossed over this a little bit, but do you remember during uh, load analysis, remember how ultimately we have either the truck and the lane or the tandem and the lane that we have to consider? Remember, we have three components of our uh, vehicular live load. We have the design truck, the design tandem, and then the design lane load. The design lane load is just 640 pounds per foot, and you place that wherever uh, is appropriate. Everybody kind of remember that? So what I want to do today is I want to kind of get into the mechanics of, well, how do you actually do live load analysis? Dead load analysis is pretty easy. You got a beam, you got some dead load on it, WL squared over 8 if it's simply supported. Boom, there's your moments. WL over 2, there's your shears. Like it, it's, you know, it's, it's pretty simple. If you took structural analysis, you should sleep through that. Um, live load analysis, though, is a little different. Um, it's going to combine some things that we discussed in structural analysis. Um, which I'm going to kind of review for everybody because uh, it's a little, it's pretty important, um, and it's also going to combine some stuff that you haven't seen before. So ultimately, what we're trying to do in a live load analysis is this. So let's say I have a bridge. The bridge goes from point A to point B, and let's say here's my design vehicle. What we have to answer are really two things. Number one, where the truck goes this way, so it's longitudinal placement, and then other the other question we have to answer is where does the truck go this way, transversely uh, along the section? Now, we answer the, the question of longitudinal placement through the theory of influence lines. And so I'm going to kind of review that today. And then the transverse placement, we really don't figure out where to put it uh, transversely. Instead, we compute what's called a live load distribution factor. And it's basically a worst case scenario computation that helps you determine how much truck goes to each beam if you're looking at moment or shear or, or single lane loaded scenarios, multiple lane loaded scenarios, there's a whole a litany of things you have to look at. <coughs> All right, so let's, um, let's, let's sort of get back into the swing of things. So permanent loads, dead loads, that's easy. You know, you have a beam, load on it. I think you all can do that structural analysis pretty straightforward, forwardly. Live loads, like I said, we've got, um, we got two issues that we've got to deal with. Live load distribution factors uh, and influence lines. So let me Let's, let's just get back into the swing of things, talking about influence lines. So I covered this in structural analysis, but I know that for some of you that might have been a while, uh, been a little while ago, so let's sort of get back into that. So what is an influence line? How do you construct an influence line? Remember how this works. Okay, you, let's say you got a beam. Uh, it's simply supported. It could be a truss. It could be whatever. How do we do this? We identify a point on the structure that we're interested in. So here's the beam. Let's say I want to know the shear here, or I want to know the moment here. And I keep my eye fixed on that point. And then what I do is I take a single unit load. So we're dealing with US units, so we can think of it as a one-kip load. 
We take that one kip load and we move it across the structure. And as we move it across the structure, again, we keep our eye fixed on our point of interest. And as we move that load across the structure, we record the response at that point of interest. We plot that response, and that plot is called an influence line. And so this is the example that I use in, in 312, so uh, I think you all probably remember this. So we have a beam, uh, simply supported, we'll say it's 80 foot long for the purposes of discussion, and then what we're going to do is we're going to look at the reaction at A, okay? And so on the bottom, we're going to plot the influence line for the reaction at A. So for instance, if I put the load right on A, it's a one kip load, so the reaction is one, okay? As I take that load and I move it from A to B, the reaction at A goes down. So, so for instance, if I put the uh, load, let's say, right smack dab in the middle of the beam, bless you, if I put the load right smack dab in the middle of the beam, then the reaction at A is one half, okay? And so I keep doing that until I get to the point where the load is at B. I think if I place the load at B, there is no reaction at A. And so you can kind of see how this works out. And you have an influence line that looks something like this. And so that, that plot right there would be the influence line for the reaction at A. Now, one thing to keep in mind to remember, and for statically determinate structures, influence lines are always just that. They are lines, okay? Now, I'm not going to get into the, 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 the proof uh, of that here, but you all remember the Mueller-Breslau principle? Remember that? Remember how, a, a graphical way of drawing an influence line? Remember, if I want to draw the influence line for the reaction at A, I kick that support out. And so if I kick the support out at A, what does the beam do? It acts like that. It just sort of flops down, right? And if I take that and I move it through a unit displacement, if I take point A and I pick it up one, it's going to act like that. And so that's how we can graphically uh, draw an influence line. We're not really going to have to do that in here because we'll have some software and some things that will make our life a little easier but I just wanted to make sure that everybody was, was clear on that. So again, for statically determinate structures, influence lines are always linear. For indeterminate structures, they'll have some curvature to them. All right? They are incredibly critical for, um, sorry, they are incredibly critical for, uh, for bridges, okay? Because, for, really for two reasons. Number one, they graphically tell us where to put the load to maximize the response. And B, they will do the analysis for us. So for instance, if I have the HL93 truck, okay, so let, let's, let's just bring this back you know, to, to, to reality. I have an influence line for the reaction at A. So from a, from a practical standpoint, this would be quite useful if I was trying to design, let's say, the abutment at A. Okay? So <clears throat> if I'm trying to design the abutment at A, now let's just use some common sense. If I'm trying to design the abutment at A, and I've got to move that truck to generate the worst response at A, where am I going to put that truck? As close to A as possible, right? So remember that axle spacing is variable. I'm going to keep that axle spacing as short as possible, keep it at 14 feet, and I'm going to stick the heavy axles, the rear axles, towards A. So really I'm going to put my truck like that. I'm going to put it towards A. I'm going to have the front facing towards B so that I have the heavy axles over at A. And I'm going to keep that, that rear axle spacing at 14 feet. And so, but that's what the influence line tells us as well. Look at the influence line. The larger values, the higher values are towards A. So it tells you where to put the load. Once you do that, not only, can you, um, uh, not only does it tell you where to put the load, but it'll do the analysis for you. So, so remember, let's say I have a beam. Let's say here's the support and here's the support. And so for the sake of discussion, let's say I have a, a, a five-pound book. If I put a five-pound book right smack dab in the middle of the beam, what are the reactions? Two and a half, right? If I put a 42-pound book or a 42-pound weight in the middle of the uh, beam, 21 and 21, right? And so the idea is if I can determine the response due to a load, in this case we use a unit load, I can determine the response due to any load anywhere. And so all I have to do is take those loads, multiply them by where they show up on the influence line, and boom, I've got the reaction at A. And if you don't believe this works, just some moments at B to determine the reaction at A, and you will get 63.6 kips. So it's a pretty useful tool, okay? 
Now, everybody should remember this from 312, right? So, everybody good so far? Any questions? Okay. <coughs> Y'all remember this? So, this is what the influence line, let's say, for shear looks like and the influence line for moment uh, looks like. So, one of the things that we're going to have to deal with uh, in this design, uh, in this design process, is the concept of an envelope. Okay? So, for instance, let's take shear. Okay? Excuse me. So, remember, we have a, a, a positive uh, uh, region of the influence line for shear and a negative influence line for the region of shear. So, for instance, let's take our lane load. Remember that lane load is 640 pounds per foot. It's a distributed load, right? So here, here's what I'm saying. If I'm trying to, so let's say I, I've got my beam and I'm focused on this point right here. And I'm trying to determine the worst case, let's say, shears at that point. Well, it, it's not as simple as just, well, here's the worst case scenario. I have a worst case positive scenario and a worst case negative scenario. What this influence line tells me is that if I want to generate, let's say, the worst case positive shear, I would put the load right here. Why am I putting it there? Because that's everywhere that I have a positive shear. Now, does anybody remember this? How would I actually determine the shear? I'd take 640 pounds per foot times what? Anybody remember this? So what's that? The area, right? Remember, you take 640 pounds per foot times the area under the influence line, and that would give you the maximum positive shear, right? And then you'd have, let's say, a maximum negative shear. You'd take 640 pounds per foot times this area, right? So remember, when it comes to, to situations where you're dealing with moving loads, it's not as simple as just here's the load, it's here's the range of loads that, that this uh, uh, region needs to be able to withstand. So you might have a, 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 an influence line, or you might have a situation where you're looking at shear, and that, that uh, region in shear has to be able to withstand anywhere from like positive 20 kips to negative 10 kips because of the, 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 um, because of the nature of, 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 uh, of you know, influence lines. So is everybody okay with this? All right, one thing to keep in mind, here I'll erase this, just for sake of discussion. One thing to keep in mind, the, one of the, the, the downsides or the issues with influence lines is that influence lines, while they are incredible analytical tools that will help you address moving loads, the problem with them is that they will only help you determine the response at a particular point. So the question is, how many points are enough, right? What, what do I do? Do I just pick one point on the structure? Do I pick six? Like, how many different points do I pick on the structure? Well, it is common convention in bridge engineering to always draw influence lines and determine moments of, uh, and shears at tenth points. Okay? And so we're all going to be doing that uh, in here. And I think you'll kind of see what I mean uh, here in a second. If you recall, um, one of the things I mentioned was um, uh, influence lines for indeterminate structures would be curved. Okay? I think you're going to kind of see after this uh, example uh, how this would work and, and ultimately what I'm going to need you to request of me. So what I have here uh, is a, a bridge. Let's say the bridge has two 90-foot spans. Okay, so this structure is, high, it is indeterminate. How, well, I say highly indeterminate. It's not highly indeterminate. How indeterminate is it? First degree, right? It has one extra support, okay? So what we would do is we would divide this structure into tenth points, okay? And so what that means is that for every tenth point along the span, we're going to draw an influence line. So we're going to draw an influence line at 9 feet, at 18 feet, at 27 feet, at 36 feet. And we're going to draw influence lines for each of those four points. So we're going to do an influence line analysis. You know, draw the influence line, 
put the load in the worst case scenario, determine the response. So, so I just want to show you kind of what influence lines look like for indeterminate structures. So here, so what we have here, this is an influence line at nine feet. So nine feet away from the support, I'm drawing a section and I'm saying, okay, what's the influence line? Now, pop quiz, let's see if everybody remembers this. How much is that jump? That's one, right? Why is it one? Because that's how much the load is, right? Okay, so this is what the influence line would look like for uh, 0.1L. And then I'm going to skip forward a few slides. You can kind of see as we move across the span, the influence line changes, but you can kind of see a definite pattern going on. Everybody see that? And so one thing for shear, like the influence line kind of changes its direction. So this would be the influence line on shear just to the left of the support, and this is what it would look like just to the right. It kind of kind of flips. All right. Yes. <laughs> That's a good question. The answer is probably no. What I would do is um, I would s still do the tenth and just linearly interpolate. But I think also there's something to be said about scale. Um, if I had a bridge that was two 90-foot spans, that's good enough. If I had a bridge that was two 350-foot spans, I'd probably do more than 10th feet or 10th points. I might do 20th points or, or something like that. I, I might be more accurate. You can be as accurate as you want, because, uh, but ultimately what you're going to do is if you ever need moments or shears in between point A and point B, you're just going to linearly interpolate anyway. So, so. Even though, that, that's a good, that's a good, you know, you look at these, you go, wait, is linear interpolation even reasonable? Because that doesn't look very linear to me. Well, that's one of the, I'll say two things. One, that's one of the reasons why we use tenth points. So if all I did was draw an influence line, let's say, for the middle of each span and that's it, that wouldn't be good enough. We need enough more data in order to accurately represent what's going on. But in the end, tenth points, that's close enough for government work uh, in most applications. If you've got much longer spans, like super long spans, you know, like uh, the cable stayed bridge over here. I'd probably use more than 10 points on something like that, but that's not an everyday bridge. That's once in a lifetime, so I'd be super accurate on that one. Any other questions? This is good stuff. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. So for each one of these scenarios, I want to show you something. I want to show you this. So for each one of these scenarios, what you would do is you would do a, a, a maximum uh, placement analysis, you know, very similar to what we did before. So let, let's, let's look at, let's say, the moment influence line, okay? So what I have here is the moment influence line, and I just picked one. I just said, let's just do the moment influence line at 0.4, okay? What I would do uh, with this influence line is I'd say I'd use this influence line to try and determine worst case placements for the truck, for the lane, for the tandem, for all of these different load cases. So I propose that if this is my situation, um, what we're going to have to do is, is determine these uh, worst case placements. And these worst case placements are going to generate what are called envelopes. We're not looking at shear and moment diagrams really uh, anymore. We're looking at shear and moment envelopes. We're looking at worst case scenarios. So for instance, I propose that if we were trying to determine the worst case positive bending moment, so smiley face bending moment, uh, at 0.4L, that I'd probably place the truck r like this. I'd have my heaviest axle placed right over that point load right here, and then depending upon which value was bigger, put the other 32 kip here and the 8 kip here. And if you do the scaling, this value ends up being a little bigger. But that'll generate the worst case positive bending moment. For the worst case negative bending moment, where do you think I'm going to put the truck? Over there, right? Probably somewhere about like that, okay? And how do I do the analysis? Well, there's two ways of doing it. I could take this problem, put it in RISA, run the, uh, or STAT or whatever program you want, uh, and run the analysis, or I can say 32 times that value, 8 times that value, 32 times that value. So at any one random point on the structure, dependent upon where the truck is, the truck could cause the beam to bend in a smiley face fashion or a frowny face fashion. So there's going to be a range of moments that that particular point needs to be able to withstand. <coughs> For the lane load, I do something very similar. Um, I propose that if I'm trying to determine maximum positive moment, I'd put the load everywhere that the influence line is positive, and if I'm trying to determine negative moment, 
I'd put the, uh, the distributed load anywhere the influence line is negative. And same process as before. Distributed load times the area under the curve. Distributed load times the area under the curve. And so we do this for every tenth point along the bridge, and we end up generating a table that looks something like this. Okay? Now, <coughs> I'll go ahead and tell you, um, give me one second, I'll, I'll, I'll entertain a question. I'll go ahead and tell you that we, uh, in this course, aren't really going to have to deal with these. Okay? We don't have to deal with these or these because these are only instance, are, are investigations that you have to consider for negative bending. We only have a support here and a support here. So the beam is never going to frowny face. It's always going to smiley face. So we don't have to consider this. If you ever have a pier in the middle and you have negative bending, you, you have to consider that. So we, we don't have to worry about it. Yes? That's a great question. Um, th 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 that's a fantastic question. So um, what she asked, and I want to repeat that for the recording, is what's the point of generating this at every tenth point if really all you care about is the worst case scenario? It's a great point. Um, I want to give you two very simple scenarios why you would need um, things at tenth points. Number one is fatigue. Okay? So um, depending upon the span of your bridge and depending upon the configuration, you're going to, well, first off, you are going to need some type of cross frame. If you're, let's, let's say if we're looking at steel, you're going to need some type of cross frame or some type of diaphragm to brace the girders this way, right? So, dependent upon where you put those uh, cross frames, you might have one right smack dab in the middle of the bridge, you might not. So, let's say you had a 60 foot bridge, you might just have them at 20 feet, right? So, you might have a beam. You might have a cross frame here, 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 and here. So you don't need bending moments in the middle. You need these as well, right? Okay, and so that's, that's one other point. What about this? What happens when you have a beam that has a flange transition? Well, that's a good, that's a good idea, but uh, that, that's a good point. But you also would be adding some cost to the bridge. See if you could you could have a welded girder with a flange transition, so it's still one piece. But then you need moments, but but then you need moments and shears right there. So think about it. You need moments and shears wherever you have a flange transition. You need moments and shears wherever you have a cross frame. You need moments and shears in the middle. So instead of trying to say, well, I need moments and shears for all these little individual points. Why don't I just keep it simple and say, why don't I just get moments and shears for the whole span and just interpolate in between whenever I need? Not if it's welded. Not if it's welded. Because if it's welded, what you can do is this. If you have, you know, let's say here's a flange and here's a flange and you're welding them together, what you end up doing is this. You end up saying, Here's your flange. We grind this smooth a little bit, and we just fill all that with weld. And there you go. So you actually don't need a physical plate binding those together, because you're just going to, for lack of a better term, you're going to weld the hell out of it. So what's called a, a, a groove weld. If you ever hear the term CJP weld or a PJP weld, it's basically just physically welding the plates together from, from end to end. And so there's actually not really much of a design from a weld standpoint, because we weld those so that they're so strong that they're stronger than the, the flanges. So you don't really have to design it. So. I, I'm sure I did. <laughs> That's one way of doing it. Another way of doing it is, 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 a, is a welded splice. Because, well, you're right, you're right. The reason why I dis didn't suggest it during that lecture, that's a great point, but think about context. What we were talking about was shipping lengths. So in that instance, you're not, the point is, unless you're in Texas, you're not going to weld in the field. But that doesn't change, that doesn't mean you can't have a welded splice in the shop. Like you could have a bigger, let, let, let's, let's, for the sake of discussion, let's say you have a maximum shipping length of 80 feet. You could have a girder that's, 30 feet this big, 50 feet this big, 
welded together and just ship it as one, one unit. You can do that, no problem. And that's going to mean a lighter girder. Does that make sense? Unless you're in Texas. No, I'm serious. Unless, unless you're in Texas. Texas, that's like the only state in the country that allows that. So. Because they're, they're Texas. No, no it's, because, it's because they have a specialized team that's certified to do that. And they're like the only state in the union that has that. So. Okay. Here's another reason why you need shears. Here you need forces across the span. And it's not really so much related to moments, but it is related to shears, okay? When we do shear design, and by shear design, I'm really talking about two things. I'm talking about design of the studs and design of any shear reinforcement. You need shears across the span, okay? And so, uh, do you all remember, uh, for those of you who already had concrete design, you remember in concrete design how we did stirrups? Remember that? And remember to do stirrup design, you needed the shear diagram. You need the whole thing because you had to be able to figure out your ranges. Well, the same thing is going to be true if the steel beam needs to be reinforced or the concrete beam needs to be reinforced. You also need that distribution of shear to figure out the stud layout. And so really the, the long story short is you need these forces everywhere. And so that, that's what I was saying earlier. The question is, well, because an influence line only gives you the forces at one point, well, how much is enough? And typically in bridge engineering, Tenth points are enough, and that's that's in practice. Typically, what every software package, every practicing engineer will do. So I'm just curious: is there anybody in here that's ever used a program called MDX? Anybody heard? You you use MDX? Looks like it was written back in the 80s, right? But MDX report it, it's a program for for steel bridge design. It reports results in tenth points, right? No problem. Okay. Close enough for government work. Sound good? You can actually get RESA to report results in 10th points as well. If you click the little globe on top of RESA, there's a, a, an option where it says the number of internal sections. And so if you change that to 11, so it's like 11 sections or 11 cuts means 10 chunks. So it'll, it'll report in 10th points if you change that to 11. Right. Everybody good? And so what we would do with each of these, so you'll do a separate analysis for the truck, do an analysis for the lane, an analysis for the tandem. You actually do another analysis for the fatigue truck. The difference between the truck and the fatigue truck is that axle spacing is fixed at 30 feet. That's just how the, uh, the spec was, was derived. So truck moments and fatigue moments, they're a little bit smaller. So there'll be, be four analyses that you conduct. And then you'll take each of these columns and say, okay, 1.33 times the truck, here's some values. 1.33 times the tandem, here's some values, and so on and so forth. And so when it's all said and done, you will have these shears, you know, accounted for, you know, with all these different cases according to the spec. The, the problem with everything that I've been discussing up until now is really all we've been looking at is this sort of fictitious, idealized beam. You know, we've just been saying, you know, a line. And here's a beam with a triangle and a circle at each end, okay? The, the problem with that is, well, if I have a, a bridge that has, let's say, six I-beams on it, well, how much load goes to that beam or that beam or that beam? So that, that's the, the second question. The first question is, well, how do we determine where the loads go this way? That's influence lines of what I've been doing here. If some of this math and some of all these calculations seem a little daunting to you, don't worry, I'm going to help you out with that. This is like the one thing that I'm not going to make you do by hand. So there's software for this, don't worry. <coughs> that's an impact factor. Okay, that's a good question. Um, when you drive on 3rd Avenue in Huntington, what do you hit? Potholes, right? And so bridges have, you know, that was an easy question to answer, right? So in all seriousness, bridges are not super smooth like glass. They have a roughness to them. And so what happens, it must, what happens when you hit a pothole? Boom. And so the bridge isn't experiencing that static vehicular load. It's experiencing that vehicular load amplified by some dynamic impact. And so that's what impact is.
Okay. We used to calculate impact factors, but somebody got smart a while back and said, let's just keep it simple and keep it 1.33. And so you only apply the 1.33 to the vehicular loads, the truck and the tandem for the lane. That's just simulating that steady state of traffic, so we, we, don't, we don't apply it. So what, what we're going to do next time, this is what we're going to do next time. We've answered the question this way. Next time we're going to answer the question this way. And that's where live load distribution factors come into play. We're gonna, don't worry. We're going to do a lot of examples on this so you're not going to be lost. And I'm going to help you out with some of this uh, uh, analysis later on. Everybody good? And again, if you got questions moving forward. Okay.